Um, I'd like to turn to our next speaker. I'm hoping she's joined us by now, uh, Dr. Catherine Fijeski uh, from the Canadian Animal Health Institute, who will also bring us into a, an oftentimes neglected aspect, and that is the role of history, uh, the issues of civilization, colonization, the egregious problems associated with uh, colonization um, and the ongoing struggles around the world with health disparities, particularly among our indigenous populations. And in this case, in uh, Canadians First Nations and in some other remote communities in the Canadian far north. Dr. Fajeski, please. Yes, hi, Dr. Ruprecht, and thank you so much for having me here today. Um, hopefully everyone can see my screen. Uh, so as Dr. Rubrick just mentioned, um, I, I've spent a, a number of years now working uh, on trying to sort of come up with innovative approaches to uh, rabies prevention and control in uh, Canada's remote First Nations, Métis, and Inuit communities. Uh, and they face some very specific challenges, despite the fact that we have a very well-developed uh, veterinary infrastructure in Canada, particularly in the South. Um, and yet we really struggle to uh, implement effect effective rabies prevention and control um, outside of those sort of heavily populated uh, urban regions uh, of the country. Uh, and uh, the first thing sort of I want to start off with is, is sort of ensuring that what I am telling you about sort of what some of the underpinning history uh, that informs uh, our challenges and, and needs to inform sort of how we approach solutions in these areas comes not from my own personal opinions, <laughs> but is, uh, is very much sort of the way that our First Nations um, really see sort of that, that historical context and, and how they see sort of the evolution of their interactions with um, uh, everything from public health authorities to the government in Canada. Um, so what I'm going to use is the framework that I first encountered uh, up in a community on the James Bay coast, which is in Northern Canada, just off of Hudson's Bay. Uh, this is Moose Cree First Nation, and they had a wall mural um, that um, sort of presented what they see as sort of this, the cycle of history and the cycle of, of how their relationships both within their own communities and between their communities and sort of the, the Canadian authorities or the Crown as it may be, have evolved over time. Uh, and I know that the writing on this can be a little bit hard to see, so I've, I've sort of fished them out um, and put them into these boxes um, uh, just to sort of see, let you see sort of the individual content of each of these. And as I go through our present, my presentation, we're actually going to actually focus on each one of these uh, uh, blue boxes that you see on the screen here uh, to give you a little bit of the background um, and, and hopefully sort of help you understand um, ju just what some of these challenges are and, and where their roots lie and what does that mean in terms of, of where do we go from here. Uh, so it all starts, of course, in the pre-European contact era. Um, and, and the fact is sort of particularly in the North, uh, dogs have always been a part of Indigenous culture in Canada. When people first came across the land bridge from Alaska tens of thousands of years ago, they came with their dogs uh, and, and they came with what they could carry. Uh, and in many ways, that traditional culture was structured uh, around the framework that was set by life with dogs. The dogs had to be fed, the dogs had to be taken care of, um, the dogs were needed to go and get water, the dogs were needed to hunt, the dogs were needed to bring back food. So this pre-European contact era that was really dominated by traditional societal structures, uh, traditional education, um, societal control through values, a respect for elders, and a harmony with creation um, is sort of where, where our First Nations peoples uh, and our, our Inuit uh, and Métis communities, um, that's where their roots really were prior to coming into contact with the Europeans. Uh, and in traditional Northern Indigenous culture, dogs, as I mentioned, were the, the main means of transportation. They were integral to a community being able to find and obtain food, uh, particularly in, in the winter when there was snow on the ground. They provided warmth, they provided companionship and protection. So they were really an essential part of all aspects uh, of life. 
uh, and life in the North as a result then really centered around men's relationship with dogs and dogs really determined the day-to-day -day schedule of, of life uh, in a very sort of um, integral and, and basic way. Uh, we move then sort of into that second um, historical frame of, of uh, or phase rather, uh, and that is sort of the contact era. So once the Europeans came into contact with the First Nations in Canada, uh, we have the implementation of, of a system of colonialism. Um, and this contact era was dominated by economic considerations like the fur trade. Uh, so there were beaver pelts uh, that formed sort of the basis of uh, all the economic activity of uh, entities like the Hudson's Bay Company. Um, and as a result of this entire sort of economic underpinning of, of the discovery, uh, in quotes, of, of the New World, Canada's First Nations lost about 98% of their original lands due to exploration, the activities of the Hudson Bay Company and various other legal means such as the treaties, um, such as treaties and, and the Indian Act itself. Uh, and this was a really devastating uh, period of time in terms of the impact on our indigenous peoples. Uh, it saw the creation of the reserve system, uh, which was an artificial sort of governance con construct that was imposed on communities uh, by, by the English Crown and the Canadian government. Uh, and about 90% of our native populations died of, of diseases, most of them infectious and most of them introduced by contact with, with the Europeans. But the other element of, of the colonial period really is um, a, a systematic um, implementation of policies of uh, assimilation uh, and policies of really eradicating uh, indigenous culture, indigenous language, um, and trying to, to sort of force the assimilation and, and incorporation of these indigenous populations into a set, what was essentially sort of white society at that point in time. From a legal perspective, we have the uh, implementation of the Indian Act in 1876 in Canada, and that, that legal construct is actually still in place today uh, in 2022. And as a part of the, the core part of, of assimilation policies really functioned uh, or focused on the creation of a system of residential schools. So between 1830 and 1996, which is, which is only uh, a few decades ago, uh, there were approximately 130 residential schools across Canada, uh, and a, an estimated total of about 150,000 Indigenous children attended those schools, um, and they had a really devastating impact um, on, on the populations, not only at the time, but created sort of a legacy of intergenerational trauma that we are still coping with today. Um, and that still really creates some very significant challenges um, when we talk about trying to um, implement programs and initiatives like rabies prevention and control in these communities. The estimates are that about a third of those children, so 150,000 died while attending the schools. Uh, a lot of that was due to diseases uh, like tuberculosis, uh, but others as well. Uh, so my apologies for that. Um, the impact of, of on, on dog populations um, to continue uh, in addition to sort of how, how we extrapolate the impact of that, uh, of, of what residential schools did to the humans in the population in the communities um, was really determined by the fact that Indigenous peoples really lost uh, their ties to their cultural traditions and to their very identity. Um, and that really meant that um, there was a loss of the traditional relationships between Indigenous communities and their dogs. The bond that, that had been in place for uh, centuries, if not thousands of years, was essentially broken. And that was sort of further exacerbated uh, in the mid uh, 20th century with the arrival of the uh, gas powered snow machines in the north. Um, that further contributed to the disappearance of dog sled teams. So dogs, dogs were no longer integral to daily survival in the North uh, because you could use your gas powered snow machine to go and get water, to go out to, to check your traps, uh, to, to hunt uh, and do everything else. And that really sort of seemed to be the final major blow to the traditional uh, human dog relationship in the North. Um, and this is this sort of breakdown of the relationship that saw a, a organized um, and, and very effective way of caring for and managing dog populations in the north uh, is further complicated by the fact that we have a high risk of rabies in, in our remote northern indigenous communities. 
Uh, and that's because the, the virus circulates freely in the Arctic fox and the red fox populations in the north. Uh, eradication or elimination of the virus um, from those populations in the same way that we have successfully been able to manage in, in the southern parts of the country is not possible uh, because of, of cost prohibitiveness and, and just sort of the vast expanses of territory that we're talking about. Um, and, and this risk is really kind of uh, accelerating and changing um, very quickly right now because of the impact of climate change uh, in the north. Um, and factors that are increasing that risk have to do with changing population dynamics between red foxes and Arctic foxes. So we're seeing expansion of red fox populations into Arctic fox habitats. Um, and we're also starting to see the encroachment of skunk populations moving northward. Um, that may not be the case up in the, the, the most northern parts of, of the country, up in, in Nunavut or the Northwest Territories, but we are seeing it in the provinces where you have uh, First Nations communities um, that are sort of north of, of uh, established urban regions um, who are for the first time ever starting to see skunks uh, appear uh, in and around their communities when, when that was never seen before. Um, which brings us sort of to the, the post-contact era uh, and where we are today. Um, and uh, well, okay, let's, let's, where we are today as sort of the basis and then we'll move into, into what truth and reconciliation is and, and how that's really changing uh, over the last couple of years now. But this post-European contact era um, really saw our First Nations communities um, devolving into deplorable conditions and poverty, um, the loss of lands uh, and the confinement of First Nations uh, populations on the reserves and this artificially created uh, uh, reserve system, the loss of cultural language and traditional values and lifestyle that we've been talking about, um, and a lot of that has translated into some really significant major social problems, um, including widespread um, suicide. We routinely see in the Canadian news um, coverage of essentially what are, are deemed sort of suicide outbreaks around, for example, teenagers in, in First Nations communities, um, a high degree of, of drug abuse, alcoholism, um, crime, domestic violence, violent deaths um, that really, um, create sort of a lot of, of problems within these communities that they need to try to deal with and address. Um, and it can be very difficult then to get them to say, well, can we pay attention to dog vaccination and control of, of, of rabies when you're, you're dealing with, you know, multiple teenagers, for example, who, who are committing suicide in a short period of time. Um, so in addition to sort of the, the First Nations perception of, of what their conditions are like, which is what is in the blue box there, um, we, we now also have a relatively new phenomenon um, that has emerged in the last sort of 50 to 100 to 150 years uh, in these communities, which is, is dog overpopulation. Uh, and that is really a problem from a rabies prevention control perspective because these roaming dogs regularly come into contact with rabies reservoir species, um, which have traditionally been sort of Arctic foxes, but are now being joined by red foxes. And in some cases in sort of the, the more Southern reach parts of, of remote Canada, um, skunks as well. So um, we, we have sort of a really decreased ability uh, in terms of rabies prevention and control that has been uh, the seeds of which really lie within sort of the experience with the residential school system and, and colonialism. Um, so within the communities, we have a, a, <laughs> a very well-founded, um, I would say, uh, distrust of, of government and public health authorities. Um, we also have issues in terms of inadequate medical infrastructure to treat uh, serious bites uh, by dogs. Uh, we also deal with issues around significant delays in post-exposure prophylaxis delivery and administration to humans. Uh, and there's also no ongoing access to regular veterinary services. So uh, if we are already struggling to uh, deliver human medical services, you can only imagine sort of what we, we are able to do in terms of veterinary services. Uh, and the most basic of those, of course, from a rabies prevention and control perspective being sort of uh, rabies vaccinations. Uh, and on top of that, we, we really have a lack of adequate surveillance for rabies in the north. Um, and that, that further contributes to the problem because it generates uh, an inaccurate or incomplete picture of rabies risk in these communities, which makes it very difficult for us then to, to sort of highlight the need uh, for trying to create some of this infrastructure um, when, when we can't say, well, you're seeing sort of a huge outbreak um, or you're having a lot of, of virus circulating around these communities when we don't have the data to, to actually present. 
Next slide, please. Um, oh, and I have no idea why the font is doing that at your end, but that's not what it looked like in my slide. Okay, uh, and can you click again? There's another animation in this one, I think. Um, and that brings us to sort of truth and reconciliation, which is something that has really emerged in the Canadian consciousness and emerged as, as a movement, I think, in Canadian society uh, over the past few years. And, and the terminology around truth and reconciliation comes from um, what was the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada, which was created in 2008 as a result of a legal settlement, settlement between the survivors of, survivors of the residential school system, the Assembly of First Nations, the Inuit representatives, and the parties that were responsible for the creation operation uh, of the residential schools, uh, and that those being sort of the, the federal Canadian government. Um, and the church bodies, uh, including the Roman Catholic Church, uh, the Anglican Church, etc. And the mandate of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada was to inform all Canadians about what had happened in the residential schools and what that really meant for our, our current uh, First Nations, Inuit and, and Métis uh, uh, communities. Uh, and the commission came out with a comprehensive report um, on the policies and the operations of the schools and their lasting impacts uh, and included sort of 10 principles that needed to underlie reconciliation and 94 calls to action um, that were intended to speak to all sectors of, of Canadian society. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, okay, and, and oh, well, okay. Um, so among the, re the recommendations in the uh, Truth and Reconciliation Committee report um, was call to action number 19, which was really to uh, look at identifying and closing the gaps in health outcomes between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal communities in Canada, uh, especially when it came to um, indicators around, and there's a long list there, but the ones that I think are really relevant to rabies prevention and control would be child health issues, uh, illness and injury incidents, and the availability of appropriate health services. So certainly the prevalence of dog bites in our Aboriginal communities, which is much higher um, than what we would see in, in urban settings uh, and in southern parts of, of Canada, uh, directly affects child health, illness, and, and injury incidents uh, within the community. And certainly sort of the availability of appropriate animal health um, services is, is key um, and, and is directly linked to uh, determining health outcomes in, in communities. And I think that's particularly clear to this audience as we're talking about sort of One Health uh, implementation. Next slide, please. So what does all of that mean um, when we're trying to determine what do successful interventions look like going forward in these communities as a result of, of our awareness um, of, of what has happened in the past and what the challenges are um, and how does truth and reconciliation really fit into that? Um, and I think that the first thing that, that we really need to recognize, and this is something that I think the veterinary profession in Canada is coming to a, a slow realization about, um, is that any veterinary public health initiatives in Indigenous communities in Canada have to take into account the ongoing impacts of residential schools. Um, we need to consider differences in terms of how these communities view and live with their dogs, both historically and today. Um, and the other thing I think we really need to recognize is that interven interventions that have been really, really successful in urban settings in Canada uh, in terms of, of the elimination, for example, of fox rabies variants um, from southern Canada, um, and the elimination of, of the canine strain of, of rabies um, from Southern Canada are generally not workable in remote communities. Um, and they often contain elements which may not be culturally appropriate. So in the South, we have traditionally relied on vaccination campaign, parental vaccination campaigns that rely on a, a, a access to veterinary services and a well-developed veterinary infrastructure. That does not exist in the North. Um, and is not going to exist in the North at, at any point in time in, in the near future. Uh, and the other component that has been largely successful in terms of, of controlling rabies in dogs, specifically in the South, um, have been large scale um, spay neuter programs to reduce populations. Um, and that one is a little thornier um, in the North and I'll talk about that, uh, uh, about why that is specifically. So while we recognize that managing the dog population in terms of population numbers is incredibly important, we need to be careful about how we do that in the North. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and to give you an example from a community in Northern Ontario, this is one that we worked with extensively when I was at the Ministry of Health uh, in, in Ontario uh, a few years back now. 
but this was a community that worked really, really hard um, to um, manage to get their dog population under control. They had three to four years of spay neuter clinics that were organized by the community using a consistent approach whereby uh, female dogs were spayed preferentially. And the vast majority of male dogs were neutered. So by 2016, they had a total population of 56 dogs, which they were very happy with. Um, all the females had been spayed. Uh, and there were only sort of two intact males that, that were known sort of in the community. Five years later, uh, they were right back to square one. Um, so they, they had tried really hard and within five years of their not being spay neuter clinics continuing to come in from the outside, um, and you started to see the importation of dogs because people wanted puppies. The demand for dogs had not gone down just because the population had, gone, had gotten sort of under control. Um, they were right back to roaming packs of dogs, uh, dogs and puppies dying, uh, lots of infectious disease on the ground. Um, and they felt really, really frustrated. Um, and that was because there really wasn't uh, a plan for how to make this, this sustainable in the long run. You cannot continue to come into these communities and fly in veterinary surgical teams to do spay neuter on a long-term basis. It's not cost effective, it doesn't work. Um, and there's no ability for the community to manage their dogs by themselves without having to rely on, on exterior help. Next slide, please. Um, and there's another part of this that I think we, we haven't necessarily thought about. Um, and that is that there are some unintended consequences to mass surgical sterilization of dog populations in remote indigenous communities. And that is that what we're effectively doing then is eradicating the genetic lines of dogs that are well adapted to life in the North. Uh, and that, that is a trigger point for these communities, right? So we've already systematically tried to wipe out their culture, their language and everything else over a hundred years by surgically altering absolutely everything in these communities and preventing sort of reproduction by these dogs, we, we are effectively eradicating yet another cultural aspect. Um, and there's a lot of cultural sensitivity around forced sterilization policies that were applied to humans in these communities and particularly to women um, and, and applying that same approach to their dogs. Uh, and as we saw in, in the example that I just showed from Northern Ontario, once these sort of native Northern dogs are no longer able to reproduce uh, and demand for dogs goes up in the community again, people want puppies. What happens is that you get importation of dogs from the South into these communities. And these are dogs that are really ill-equipped to cope with life in the North. Um, we see, you know, people bringing up bulldogs who have chronic cherry eye problems. We have people bringing up boxers from the Southern United States um, that are not at all equipped to live uh, outdoors when it's minus 40 in, in January. So you see the creation of welfare problems um, that are further exacerbated by a lack of access to veterinary care uh, in the North. Next slide, please. So that brings us to, to my final slide, I think, which is what can we do? Um, and I think that the answer for these communities is to work directly with them to develop approaches that are going to be sustainable over the long term, rather than band-aids for the short term, as we saw in that example from Northern Ontario. Uh, and that means that we need to, to sort of think outside of the box, right? We can't apply the same strategies and the same approaches that we used uh, in urban centres in, in Southern Canada, uh, and worked remarkably well in the 70s, 80s, 90s, and early 2000s. But we need innovative approaches that grant communities the ability to manage their dog populations independent of outside assistance. Um, and certainly sort of, I think the work that, that we heard about uh, in terms of the ORV trial in, in Namibia would be something that would be immensely valuable um, in, in these communities in, in Northern Canada. Um, and the other side of that is the development of licensing of reproductive tools um, that are non-surgical and don't require the same level of expertise to be applied for managing dog populations. And specifically here, you know, something like the, the ability to uh, use and implement time-limited contraceptive implants in dogs that would uh, be sort of temporary in terms of time, that would allow the community to choose when they have reproduction of dogs occurring, uh, without necessarily sterilizing absolutely everything that has, you know, four paws and, and a tail in the community um, would be immensely valuable. Um, so these are all tools that I think we need to think about um, and, and develop uh, in order to be successful um, in, in the longer term. And that would be my presentation. Happy to entertain any questions now or later. Uh, and thank you. Thank you, Catherine, for bringing up an uncomfortable truth in this era of alternate truths. 
and I, I'm wondering, given some of the realities that you just described, that we're still experiencing the repercussions of the Columbian Exchange centuries later, how has this been regarded in Canada? Are most people on board with it, or are there critics who say this is revisionist history, or are there deniers? I'm, I'm curious as to what the complexion of take home is uh, in Canada regarding these realities? I think um, what what really had a huge impact um, on most Canadians across the country um, was were sort of events over the last year or two where we saw the discovery and documentation of, of mass child graves uh, on residential school sites um, that really served to um, I guess, provide evidence of, of the stories that had been circulating and, and the whispers that had been coming out of, of communities for, for decades, right? Um, so I think that represented a huge shift uh, in terms of the Canadian sensitivities around that. And uh, last year in 2021 uh, was the first year that there was a, there's been a federal holiday established um, known as Orange Shirt Day or Truth and Reconciliation Day. Um, which coincidentally is, is two days after World Rabies Day, so it's it's September 30th, um, and that there there was a huge outpouring um, of of general population support. I think to uh, First Nations communities that has happened in the last year or two um, that I don't necessarily think we would have seen before. So I, I have no doubt that there are still pockets of of sentiment whereby you know we, we already we already pay reparations we do this we do that what else do these people want I would say the average Canadian um, has has really shifted their perceptions of that and there's a great deal more sensitivity I think and recognition that uh, we, we have a lot of work to do in terms of reconciliation with our indigenous communities going forward thank you and I hope you'll stay with us for our our final discussion after our last speaker and